Mark Harper, a very good morning to you. And I will ask you a little bit about the train strikes a little bit later, but there are lots of issues that uh, to discuss this morning. So, first of all, I, I did want to talk about... Um, Tory faithful heading towards Manchester, of course, this weekend for your Conservative Party conference. But even before many of them have got there, there's already a, a warning shot uh, from some prominent voices in the party, from the likes of Priti Patel and Jake Berry and Liz Trust, who say today that they won't be voting for more tax rises. Uh, so can you rule out any more tax rises ahead of the next election? Well, look, I, I think it's worth saying, people know over the last couple of last few years, there have been two big economic shocks, the uh, COVID pandemic and then the war in Ukraine, which obviously put a big strain on public finances, meant we had to help people get through both of those shocks. That was the right thing to do. We've seen the economy respond uh, very well, with the fastest growing of the main economies in Europe post the COVID pandemic. Um, the best thing we can do to help uh, families with the cost of living is to continue delivering on one of the Prime Minister's key priorities, which is to halve inflation. We're on track to do that by the end of the year. Um, halving inflation is the best tax cut that we can deliver in the short term. That's how we help people uh, you know, with their family finances, and that's what the government is focused on delivering. Well, the Chancellor is saying today that he wants to break what he's described as the vicious cycle of, of tax rises. He's talking about doing that in part by reforming benefits and public services. I mean, that's beginning to sound an awful lot like austerity. No, it's about looking at how you deliver, for example, using modern technology. The Chancellor's talked about using artificial intelligence, about how you deliver services more efficiently so that you get more uh, for putting less taxpayers' money in, but you get better services out the other end. Uh, and and he, you would expect us to keep focused on keeping the cost of government down whilst delivering high-quality public services. I think that's very sensible. That's what you'd expect the Chancellor to be focused on. Um, it, what does he mean by reforming the benefit system, though? Well, it means keeping the benefits system under control. For example, the Work and Pension Secretary set out proposals to help people uh, to get back into work, people who may have fallen out of the workforce uh, as a result of the COVID pandemic. You know, help people get into work where they want to, get back onto into the labour market. Uh, I think those are all very sensible reforms. They help keep the benefits system uh, under control and keep costs to taxpayers down. Um, you'd expect government to be focused on things like that, and that's what the Chancellor was talking about. But, as I said, the best tax cut we can deliver this year for people is to deliver on our promise to halve inflation, and that's what we're on track to do um, following the, that commitment from the Prime Minister. Well, what, one way would, could be to, to find money uh, in expensive parts of government spending. So can I just... Uh, get you to, to confirm whether or not you're committed to the uh, triple lock and keeping uh, winter fuel payments as a universal benefit? Yes, the Prime Minister's made it quite clear that we're committed to the triple lock. I, I think he was asked that question a few weeks ago at Prime Minister's Questions. Uh, in the House of Commons, I was present to that session, and he made it quite clear not, not only that we were committed to it, we were, of course, the party that, that introduced it. So, I mean, he made that very clear. Uh, and I think he also, Number 10 also yesterday, made it clear we're committed to continuing with the winter fuel allowance. OK, let me move on to HS2, because this is a question that's been asked <coughs> of many of your colleagues. Uh, whether or not the government is committed to building the leg that goes from Birmingham to Manchester, you're the Transport Secretary. Can you clear this up for us once and for all? Are you committed to building that leg? Well, well look, I'd say two things. First of all, you'll know that the construction of HS2 is well underway, uh, and we're getting on with that. We've got thousands of people working on that at pace. We're committed to delivering it. Uh, on any other questions, I'm not going to comment. You wouldn't expect me. You might want me to, but you wouldn't expect me to comment on Why not? what is speculation that's been in the newspapers. Uh, you know, we're committed to delivering it. Uh, I'm not really going to go any further than that. There's, as you say, a lot of speculation. So can you not clear up whether or not it's happening or not? You are Transport Secretary. Do you not know whether or not that, that leg is being built? We're, look, we're getting on with delivering HS2 between uh, uh, London and Birmingham. That is underway. I've been to see that being constructed. There are spades in the ground and all sorts of other large construction equipment as well getting that project delivered. We're committed to it, uh, but I'm not going to comment on all the various bits of speculation that there have been in the media. 
when will we know whether or not the line will travel as far as Manchester? Look, I'm look, I'm you can ask whatever questions you like. I'm not going to comment on it. I'm happy to talk to you about our fantastic plan for drivers, which is after all the way most people get about. You know, most people in the country get to work, uh, get to all their important appointments, take the kids to school or whatever uh, by driving. And we've set out some some plans uh, which we've announced today, which we're going to make uh, drivers lives easier, not do what they've done in Wales, which is have blanket 20 mile an hour speed limit is uh, in inappropriate places. We're going to do things that make life easier for drivers and easier for people to get about. OK, well, let's talk about those plans. Why is the government so against these uh, 20 mile an hour speed limits? They're typically introduced in areas with high accident rates uh, and where local communities are often worried about speeding. So what's wrong with that? Should, should the government be interfering? Well, look, nothing's wrong with what you've just set out. Speed, 20 mile an hour speed limits outside schools, uh, in heavily built up residential areas or in areas with particular accident problems actually make a lot of sense. Local authorities can and do that now. That actually makes a lot of sense. What we're against and what we're going to look at strengthening guidance to prevent is what we've seen the Labour government in Wales do, which is a blanket 20 mile an hour policy uh, across uh, all urban areas in Wales and all areas, even where it doesn't make sense. That actually just makes life more difficult, not just for drivers, but also people who use buses. Uh, that doesn't make sense, and that's what we want to prevent. But there's no, we absolutely happy to have 20 mile hour speed limits where they make sense you know, outside schools uh, in uh, heavily built up residential areas or areas where there's uh, a, an accident issue, as you just set out. That makes a lot of sense. But having a blanket policy just makes life difficult for drivers uh, and doesn't deliver benefits for people. Some might worry that you're ripping up safety rules for the sake of a few votes. Well, well no, I just said we're very happy to have a 20 mile an hour speed limit outside a school or in an area where their accident record suggests that you need to do that. What doesn't make sense is having a blanket policy not fitted to the circumstances. We've seen what happens in Wales with that. It's not popular at all. It makes life more difficult for drivers, more difficult for those who use buses, which is the most popular form of public transport, uh, and it doesn't make any sense. And the Labour uh, government in Wales can see that it's not very popular uh, and is rapidly trying to backpedal on it. Um, and we're not going to do that in England. We're going to try and make life easier for drivers and have sensible policies fitted to local circumstances. There are a lot of people uh, who want to be able to use the trains as well. This weekend, many of your colleagues heading to the Tory party <coughs> conference will have some problems because there's a, another train strike on. Uh, what are you doing to get the trains up and running again? Well, a couple of things. First of all, the strike this weekend, people can see that it's timed to coincide with the Conservative Party conference. So it's very much a political strike called by the General Secretary of ASLEF, who sits on the Labour Party's National Executive Committee. But look, when I got this job, I made sure that fair and reasonable pay offers were put on the table with essential reforms that are required to make the train service uh, more fit for purpose in the modern world. Um, those were accepted by staff that work for Network Rail. We solved that dispute, that dispute's over. But on the train operating companies, uh, for, for reasons best known for themselves, the unions won't put those offers to their members. They're fair offers. Uh, you know, an, an average salary of a train driver today is £60,000 for a 35 hour, four day week. The pay offer that's on the table, if it was accepted, would take that to a £65,000 a year salary for a four day, 35 hour week. I think most people listening to this would think that was actually quite reasonable. So okay. my, uh, my message is to the union, put the offer to your members um, and see whether they accept it or not uh, and stop disrupting the general public and actually putting people off using trains, which is not in the long term interests of the rail industry or their members. And I will be talking to Mick Whelan shortly, but no doubt his message to you would be, we're not happy, we want to talk to you. He says you're in hiding and haven't spoken to him since December. Why aren't you talking to the unions? Well, look, the negotiations, the detailed negotiations on pay are obviously between the employers, the train operating companies, uh, and the trade unions. And those but, but, but while people's transport is being disrupted, is it not worth you getting involved with the talks to try and resolve it? Well, look, there's a fair and reasonable offer on the table. When people say that, what they mean is they want me to take more taxpayers' money from actually taxpayers who earn a lot less than train drivers uh, and take a short-term, easy decision to, to buy off the unions and not deliver any reform. Actually, what government's about is taking the right decisions, even if they're difficult, that are in the long-term interests of the country. And it's essential that, we, yes, we deliver a fair and reasonable pay offer to the staff that work for train companies, but also that we get some reform to make 
uh, those train companies more effective for the future. We've seen post-pandemic a 30% reduction in revenue because fewer people are using the rail network. That isn't sustainable. The bill is being paid for by taxpayers, and you'd expect me as Transport Secretary to take those difficult but right decisions for the long-term interests of the country, not take taxpayers' money for a short-term easy hit, which is what the Labour Party wants to do. OK, Mark Harper, we appreciate your time. Pleasure. Thanks very much indeed. Thank you.